Hello, I'm Professor Stephen Abbott. Welcome to the first part of my two-part series on crystallization science. This is all based on the new chapter 11 in my solubility science book, which of course is a free ebook you can readily download. So chapter 11 is all about crystallization. The apps in the book and that I'm using in this video are found on my practical solubility website. So not all of us want to make crystals this large. Note the human for scale. These are 12 by 4 meter crystals and they took about a million years to grow. The image is courtesy of Professor Alexander van Drescha, who told me that for the first couple of minutes you are so in awe of these beautiful crystals you don't realise you're going to die in the next eight minutes unless you do something about it. It's so hot and humid you die in about ten minutes. So don't try this at home. This is all about the solubility aspects of crystallization. We'll come to the crystallization part in the second video. If it's all about solubility, then we need to understand a solubility curve. So at high temperatures, 100 degrees, the solubility is high, 600 and 700 mg per mil, and at low temperatures, it's low, in this case, 42 mg per mil. And we need to know what this curve is like. What does it depend on? Of course it depends on the solvent, but first of all it depends on the solute itself. So if I have a high melting point solute, you'll see that the solubility goes down. It's only 250 mg per mil for a 240 degree melting point. It also depends on the enthalpy of fusion. If I increase the enthalpy of fusion, then the solubility goes down. If I decrease it, it goes up. It also depends on the change in heat capacity, which is a bit complicated. I'll come to that later. So that's the solute dependence, but of course it also depends on the solvent. And in this simple app, we just assume an activity coefficient, gamma. So this is an ideal solvent where the solvent and the solute are perfectly happy together. If I have a less ideal solvent, if I decrease the activity coefficient, then the solubility goes down and down and down, so I'm now in the 20 mg per mil range. You can't do anything about the melting point enthalpy of fusion. You can do a lot about the solvent. So let's find a rational choice of solvent. And to do that, we need to first calculate it. We can't do lots of solubility measurements. They're very hard work, so we do calculations. The best way to do it is via Cosmo RS, a wonderful theory developed by Andreas Klamt many years ago. I'm using the version courtesy of the Amsterdam modeling suite. What you do is you take your molecule, I'm using the well-known carbamazepine, you do a DFT calculation, a quantum mechanical calculation, and you calculate the Cosmo surface, the conductor screening model surface. And you have various charges. You have the negative charge of the carbonyl, the positive charge around the amines, and the aromatics also have some positive and negative uh, charges. And from that you can calculate the solubility. In this example I've got NMP, anisole, and cumene. We have to be more interested in the cumene, so here's a full calculation of cumene, starting at uh, 80 mg per mil, going down to nearly 0 mg per mil at uh, low temperatures. So if you want to crystallize carbamazepine, it turns out that something like cumene is a good choice. The experimental data of this curve are found in the literature, and these Cosmo RS calculations are a pretty good way of doing it. So that's how you would find the solubility aspects of a solvent. Suppose you have found the perfect solvent in terms of solubility, but you can't use that solvent because it's toxic or not green or something like that. What can you do about it? Well, one trick is via Hansen solubility, you can find out that this solvent here is outside the solubility sphere. This solubility sphere is saying that any solvent in this three-dimensional range will dissolve the solute, but this is a bad solvent and will not dissolve it. And this is also a bad solvent and will not dissolve it. If you make a 50-50 blend of these two bad solvents, you would have a perfect blend in the middle, so two bad solvents can be a good solvent. So you can replace 
a bad good solvent, i.e. one which is toxic or too costly or something, with a mix of two good, environmentally friendly, cheap, bad solvents. But just as importantly, you can make smart blends. You don't have to use bad solvents, you can use uh, less good solvents. You can do a smart blend where you fine tune things like solute solvent hydrogen bonding because crystal growth can often depend strongly on whether part of the solvent is really attracted to part of the crystal. Sometimes it can help it grow, sometimes it interferes with growth. If you can tune the blend so you keep the solubility right but change the ratio of hydrogen bonding donors and acceptors, you can tune the crystal growth. There's another set of tricks. If you can't use a cooling crystallization, you have to use anti-solvent crystallization. So you start with a good solvent and then add a bad solvent. But there's a danger here, and it's very clear in Hampton solubility space to see what's going on. We have a borderline solvent here, so it's inside the sphere, so it's still okay to dissolve it, but it's not brilliant. We have a good anti-solvent, which is quite outside, so as soon as you add a small amount of that good anti-solvent, you move outside the sphere and it will start to crystallize. That's brilliant, that's what antisolvents are for. If you use a bad antisolvent, this one here, the first thing that happens is that the solute gets taken in this direction and you end up in a really good solvent regime. So you increase the solubility, so you have to add a lot of the bad antisolvent before it'll crystallize out. So you can't crystallize with a bad antisolvent like this. You can do all these calculations in COSMORS. I find it's very good to be able to visualize it in Hansen solubility space and then do the clever calculations within Cosmo RS. We have a complexity in crystallization of zones. So here's my solubility curve, this one here. That's what we've been discussing. And if I start cooling from 40, let's say it's 40 degrees, and get to 35 degrees, then, oh, right, I'm now less than the solubility, so it should start to crystallize. In fact, there's often a dead zone where nothing will happen at all, say for one degree. Then you're in this zone here, and actually it will take forever for a crystal to appear at all. If you put a seed in, it will start to grow as a crystal, but nothing much else will happen. If you come here, if you cool to 30 degrees, if you're now below the SNT, the secondary nucleation threshold, then seed crystals you put in can actually generate more seeds and you grow more crystals more quickly. So seeds will not generate more nuclei above the SNT, but will be low. So this is often an area, a zone, where people will do practical crystallization. When we come to here, we've reached the limit of the MSZW, the metastable zone width. At temperatures above this, the crystals will not spontaneously come out. Below it, they will come out fairly easily and maybe too fast and they'll come out disordered. If you go even cooler, and if you cool very rapidly, it might actually go into the oiling out zone where it just falls out as a liquid which then refuses to crystallize or might crystallize very, very slowly. So it's important to understand these zones. I will briefly show you an app to make sense of this metastable zone width. Here's the metastable zone app. I'm not going to describe it I'm just showing you that this app exists. But what it's saying is that as my solute concentration increases, the free energy uh, will decrease, which is good, so it's happy being dissolved, and then it starts increasing, and it starts becoming unhappy. It's a bistable system. But when you reach this point, C, it is now in the spinodal regime and will automatically just fall out of solution. So this between A and C is the metastable zone. So if this is wide, you've got a wide metastable zone width. If it's very steep, you've got a small metastable zone width. It depends on the solute and the solvent. This existence of the metastable zone is nice thermodynamics. The important point is that this 
spinodal might separate out as crystals, but it might equally separate out as an oil, oiling out. But when it separates, it doesn't separate out as the liquid solute. It separates as, say, 60-40 solute to solvent blend. So what's falling out of your solvent isn't just the solute, it's the solute plus solvent. And that itself might have no interest in crystallizing. That was a digression. Let's go to think about polymorphs. Polymorphs are the same solute crystallizing in different forms. And each form has a different melting point, and it will have a different enthalpy of fusion, and will have a different heat capacity difference. And so when you do the solubility curve of one polymorph, it might look like this. When you do the solubility curve of another polymorph, it might look like this, and it may cross. So below this temperature, you will tend to get polymorph two, because it's lower solubility. If you crystallize above that temperature, you would tend to get polymorph one, because it's a lower solubility. There's lots of complexity there. And again, I have another app which describes what you would expect. If I cool from here to this point, then I would expect to have a slow appearance of polymorph one because I'm inside the metastable zone width. Here's the metastable zone width of polymorph one. If I cool, then I will have lots of one appear. If I cool below the solubility curve of number two, I'll still have lots of one despite being in zone two. And if I cool here, I will probably get two, but I'd have to be the mad to cool very quickly into that zone. This app, and you'll, you'd take more time to explore it, is a very good way to think through what happens with polymorphs. So all I wanted to do was give you a sense of what the solubility science aspects of crystallization are. In the next video, we'll explore crystallization by clusters, a relatively new way of understanding how crystallization occurs and what you can do to make it better for you.